Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you enjoy the podcast, tag us in your social media posts at Bite at a Time Books, and you'll be featured in our new Shout Out Saturday segment. At the end of each week, we'll be including a special Shout Out Saturday episode featuring whoever tagged us that week. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes, but also on our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show and YouTube where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic author to write their novels and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be continuing Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Chapter 14 Some time elapsed before I learned the history of my friends. It was one which could not fail to impress itself deeply on my mind. Unfolding as it did a number of circumstances, each interesting and wonderful to one so utterly inexperienced as I was. The name of the old man was de Lacy. He descended from a good family in France where he had lived many years in affluence, respected by his superiors and beloved by his equals. His son was bred in the service of his country, and Agatha had ranked with ladies of the highest distinction. A few months before my arrival, they had lived in a large and luxurious city called Paris, surrounded by friends and possessed of every enjoyment which virtue, refinement of intellect, or taste, accompanied by a moderate fortune, could afford. The father of Safi had been the cause of their ruin. He was a Turkish merchant and had inhabited Paris for many years. When, for some reason to which I could not learn, he became obnoxious to the government. He was seized and cast into prison the very day that Safi arrived from Constantinople to join him. He was tried and condemned to death. The injustice of this sentence was very flagrant. All Paris was indignant, and it was judged that his religion and wealth, rather than the crime alleged against him, had been the cause of his condemnation. Felix had accidentally been present at the trial. His horror and indignation were uncontrollable when he heard the decision of the court. He made at that moment a solemn vow to deliver him and then looked around for the means. After many fruitless attempts to gain admittance to the prison, he found a strongly grated window in an unguarded part of the building, which lighted the dungeon of the unfortunate Muhammadan, who, loaded with the chains, waited in despair the execution of the barbarous sentence. Felix visited the grate at night and made known to the prisoner his intentions in his favor. The Turk, amazed and delighted, endeavored to kindle the zeal of his deliverer by promises of reward and wealth. Felix rejected his offers with contempt, yet when he saw the lovely Safi, who was allowed to visit her father, and who by her gestures expressed her lively gratitude, the youth could not help owning to his own mind that the captive possessed a treasure which would fully reward his toil and hazard. The Turk quickly perceived the impression that his daughter had made on the heart of Felix, and endeavored to secure him more entirely in his interests, by the promise of her hand in marriage, so soon as he should be conveyed to a place of safety. Felix was too delicate to accept this offer, yet he looked forward to the probability of the event as to the consummation of his happiness. During the ensuing days, while the preparations were going forward for the escape of the merchant, the zeal of Felix was warmed by several letters that he received from this lovely girl, who found means to express her thoughts in the language of her lover by the aid of an old man, a servant of her father who understood French, She thanked him in the most ardent terms for his intended services towards her parent, and at the same time she gently deplored her own fate. I have copies of these letters, for I found means during my residence in the hovel to procure the implements of writing, and the letters were often in the hands of Felix or Agatha. Before I depart, I will give them to you. They will prove the truth of my tale, but at present, as the sun is already far declined, 
I shall only have time to repeat the substance of them to you. Safi related that her mother was a Christian Arab, seized and made a slave by the Turks. Recommended by her beauty, she had won the heart of the father of Safi, who married her. The young girl spoke in high and enthusiastic terms of her mother, who, born in freedom, spurned the bondage to which she was now reduced. She instructed her daughter in the tenets of her religion and taught her to aspire to higher powers of intellect and an independence of spirit forbidden to the female followers of Muhammad. This lady died, but her lessons were indelibly impressed on the mind of Safi, who sickened at the prospect of again returning to Asia and being immured within the walls of a harem, allowed only to occupy herself with infantile amusements, ill-suited to the temper of her soul. Now accustomed to grand ideas and a noble emulation for virtue, the prospect of marrying a Christian and remaining in a country where women were allowed to take a rank in society was enchanting to her. The day for the execution of the Turk was fixed, but on the night previous to it he quitted his prison, and before morning was distant many leagues from Paris. Felix had procured passports in the name of his father, sister, and himself. He had previously communicated his plan to the former, who aided the deceit by quitting his house under the pretense of a journey, and concealed himself with his daughter in an obscure part of Paris. Felix conducted the fugitives through France to Lyons and across Mount Cenis to Leghorn, where the merchant had decided to wait a favorable opportunity of passing into some part of the Turkish dominions. Safi resolved to remain with her father until the moment of his departure, before which time the Turk renewed his promise that she should be united to his deliverer. And Felix remained with them in expectation of that event, and in the meantime he enjoyed the society of the Arabian, who exhibited towards him the simplest and tenderest affection. They conversed with one another through the means of an interpreter, and sometimes with the interpretation of looks, and Safi sang to him the divine airs of her native country. The Turk allowed this intimacy to take place, and encouraged the hopes of the young lovers, while in his heart he had formed far other plans. He loathed the idea that his daughter should be united to a Christian, but he feared the resentment of Felix if he should appear lukewarm for he knew that he was still in the power of his deliverer if he should choose to betray him to the Italian state which they inhabited. He revolved a thousand plans by which he should be enabled to prolong the deceit, until it might be no longer necessary, and secretly to take his daughter with him when he departed. His plans were facilitated by the news which arrived from Paris. The government of France were greatly enraged at the escape of their victim, and spared no pains to detect and punish his deliverer. The plot of Felix was quickly discovered, and de Lacy and Agatha were thrown into prison. The news reached Felix and roused him from his dream of pleasure. His blind and aged father and his gentle sister lay in a noisome dungeon, while he enjoyed the free air and the society of her whom he loved. This idea was torture to him. He quickly arranged with the Turk that if the latter should find a favorable opportunity for escape, before Felix could return to Italy, Safi should remain as a boarder at a convent at Leghorn. And then quitting the lovely Arabian, he hastened to Paris and delivered himself up to the vengeance of the law, hoping to free de Lacy and Agatha by this proceeding. He did not succeed. They remained confined for five months before the trial took place, the result of which deprived them of their fortune and condemned them to a perpetual exile from their native country. They found a miserable asylum in the cottage in Germany where I discovered them. Felix soon learned that the treacherous Turk for whom he and his family endured such unheard of oppression, on discovering that his deliverer was thus reduced to poverty and ruin, became a traitor to good feeling and honor and had quitted Italy with his daughter, insultingly sending Felix a pittance of money to aid him, as he said in some plan of future maintenance. Such were the events that preyed on the heart of Felix and rendered him, when I first saw him, the most miserable of his family. He could have endured poverty, and while this distress had been the meat of his virtue, he gloried in it, but the ingratitude of the Turk and the loss of his beloved Safi were misfortunes more bitter and irreparable. The arrival of the Arabian now infused new life into his soul. When the news reached Leghorn that Felix was deprived of his wealth and rank, 
The merchant commanded his daughter to think no more of her lover, but to prepare to return to her native country. The generous nature of Safi was outraged by this command. She attempted to expostulate with her father, but he left her angrily, reiterating his tyrannical mandate. A few days after, the Turk entered his daughter's apartment and told her hastily that he had reason to believe that his residence at Leghorn had been divulged and that he should speedily be delivered up to the French government. He had consequently hired a vessel to convey him to Constantinople, for which city he should sail in a few hours. He intended to leave his daughter under the care of a confidential servant, to follow at her leisure with the greater part of his property, which had not yet arrived at Leghorn. When alone, Safi resolved in her own mind the plan of conduct that it would become her to pursue in this emergency. A residence in Turkey was abhorrent to her. Her religion and her feelings were alike averse to it. By some papers of her father which fell into her hands, she heard of the exile of her lover and learned the name of the spot where he then resided. She hesitated some time, but at length she formed her determination, taking with her some jewels that belonged to her and a sum of money. She quitted Italy with an attendant, a native of Leghorn, but who understood the common language of Turkey and departed for Germany. She arrived in safety at a town about 20 leagues from the cottage of De Lacy, when her attendant fell dangerously ill. Safi nursed her with the most devoted affection, but the poor girl died, and the Arabian was left alone, unacquainted with the language of the country and utterly ignorant of the customs of the world. She fell, however, into good hands. The Italian had mentioned the name of the spot for which they were bound, and after her death, the woman of the house in which they had lived took care that Safi should arrive in safety at the cottage of her lover. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Frankenstein. Don't forget to tag us on your social media posts, at Bite at a Time Books, and we hope to be able to feature you in this Saturday segment. Check out the show notes or our website, Bite at a Time Books, for the links for our show. time.